Hello. Hi. Thanks for joining me. Um, I'm just going to jump right in there with the first question. Um, so you quit your um, graphic design job, um, I think, in 2005, um, and then skateboarded across Australia. Um, how did that happen? How? How did you get to that point? Um, I a rut basically and I, I woke up pretty early on in my in my 26th year and and realized that everything that I thought I was supposed to have as an adult in our in our society I suppose um, I had but I was still utterly miserable and I could see myself living the same life with just doing a job just because it paid me not because I loved it uh, being with the same girl even though we didn't love each other anymore um, being in the same house, even though it was, I didn't have any feelings for the house whatsoever. I could see myself living that life for decades, and that terrified me. And I was surrounded by, by people who were doing exactly the same. And I thought, this is crazy. I, I can't just be depressed for the rest of my life. I'm only 25, so I need to start living a life of passion. I don't, and not of expectation. So I went snowboarding, and I wasn't very good. And then decided to be better next time I went to the, the mountain. So I got myself a long skateboard and for the first time in my life I started skating around Swansea where I was living at the time. And I'd lived there for about six years and it, and it just looked different because I was traveling around it in a different way. And that was it. The skateboard was my catalyst. Uh, two weeks later I quit my job and decided that I was just going to give myself a test for the first time in my life and prove to myself that I can actually have some self-respect and I think it mainly came down to the job and the relationship, two things that I didn't want to be doing, but I was just doing. And I couldn't quite get my head around why. So I just, I just stopped them both. And yeah, my challenge was I wanted to skateboard further than anybody else had ever skated. That's pretty amazing. How do you... Um, loads of people really dislike the jobs that they're in and they've you know got similar problems and they're in relationships that perhaps aren't perfect and everything's a bit sort of stagnant but most people don't manage to get to that point where they you know follow through that you know they might want to and they might have all these ideas but they don't ever follow through what do you think it was that made you actually do it do you think there's something different in you or no, no, I don't. I don't think there's anything different in me at all. I just, I, I, I got to the stage where everything was just falling apart. Really, um, the only thing I loved in my life was my cat, and <laughs> I, I guess I was just the relationship wasn't good, the job wasn't good. I was feeling really stagnated. I was in a house which was filled with my own stuff. And, and every time I had an opportunity, I was just lazy. I was just playing computer games a lot, and I felt my brain cells dying every day. And I guess I wanted to... Work's really important. We spend more of our adult life working than doing anything else. And, and I know now... Back then, I knew I wasn't happy and I wanted something different. But I know now that if, you're, if you do anything as a job and you don't love it, you're wasting your time. There's, there's just no point. What's the point in living a life where you're doing something you don't enjoy? What's the reason behind that? And um, I think back then, when people asked me what I did for a living, I, I was just like, oh, I'm a graphic designer. I'm not very good. I don't like it. Whatever. And then I wanted to, I wanted to be proud of the answer to that question. And so I decided to start ch chasing my passions and chasing my my talents and the things that made me happy. I was absolutely certain. I didn't know how, but I was just sure that there must be a way to make a living doing something you love. And I just wouldn't accept that there was any other way. So that was it. I just, I guess everything, I was lucky that the, the confluence of all the, the, the crap stuff in my life came together and it just forced me into making that decision. But I, I'm so glad it did because I haven't looked back. And now... Because of everything I've been through, I've, I, the last seven years has been not just adventures and crazy projects, but um, in between every one of those projects and adventures, I've been forced to kind of battle my original view of a conventional life. And I've felt the need to go back and, and 
get my own shelter again and to find a solid relationship and all of that stuff and even you know get a, a an absolute income um which I still don't have but slowly I've whittled down the reasons in the back of my mind why I thought I should have those things and now I'm just like I'm happy not have not knowing where the next paycheck's coming from I'm happy living out of a 100 liter dry bag I'm happy not necessarily having a partner until the, the right time comes along yeah. and and I've worked out why, and, the, and the, luckily those lessons now give me the ability to help other people who are in that situation get out of it. Yeah. That's value, and I've only just realized that. Yeah. I guess it, it takes a long time to understand yourself, though, doesn't it? And it's only by doing all these things that you finally kind of, you know, learn those lessons, and that really helps you move forward, I suppose. Yeah, well, whoever you are and wh whatever your background is, we all grow up in this with this society mentality. Our education system basically says you have to do this at the age of 17, 18, 19 if you're going to go on and get a degree and maybe a master's and then a job and then you can afford your house. And I didn't think that there was any other kind of way of life. And I think it, it really suffocates people because there's so there's, uh, the system that we grow up in is so inflexible. Um, like how often is the funny kid at school told by the careers advisor to go and be a stand-up comic? Yeah. Never, because it's not sensible. So I think slowly we're, we're having the ability with our, with our smartphones and all of the knowledge that in the world that we can carry around in our pockets. I think a lot of people don't use that correctly because it's lazy on the whole. But, um, there's definitely a different way, and I think slowly people are waking up to it, but I think it's just important that everyone's happy. Simply. <laughs> so, sorry. What were um what were people's reactions when you just sort of went into work quit and was like oh, I'm going to skateboard across Australia? Was it all positive, sort of a mixture? How did you deal with it? Uh, um on the whole it was pretty negative actually. Um I'd never really proved myself in anything before, so it was a surprise to everybody. Um not least to me. Uh Although I knew it was the sanest decision I'd ever made because it made sense for the first time. Um, and everything else just was put in perspective by this, the fact that I, I had so much passion for this idea. Nothing else mattered. Not even um, my old workmates who thought I was just crazy for giving up a good income or my dad who just didn't understand why I'd given up my job. Um, everyone thought I was crazy. Apart from my mum who was just like, chicken, I love you. If you need to do it. <laughs> right behind you um, and yeah I, I guess I had that for maybe three or four years just just choosing a really unconventional path and people just didn't understand because it didn't fit into their their way of thinking um, and only when I started to become at least kind of it, it appeared that I was successful because I was doing these journeys and writing books and doing lectures and people were listening to what I was saying then I then my convention got accepted by others how did you manage but to Sorry, I've interrupted you again. How did you manage to block out, the, you know, all that negativity? So that did it affect your kind of um, ability to, you know, move forward? Were you thinking maybe I shouldn't do this, or did you just sort of, you know, you were focused and you knew you were going to do it anyway? I was really focused. It took me a year, um, and, and I blocked out. It upset me sometimes when people s said harsh things, and I, I'd yet to prove myself, I guess. But I knew that I was doing the right thing. Um, what took me a while was it took me a year between getting onto the skateboard and quitting my job and then going off and doing my first journey, the length of Britain. Um, and that was because I was comfortable. Uh, and com one of my sayings, comfort kills ambition, like nothing else in your life. And I was just, I was still in my house, surrounded by my stuff uh, and my friends and my bean bags and my PlayStation. So it took me a while just to slowly whittle that down and actually get things plan but I, I knew what I was doing I knew I was going to do what I said I was going to do it just that's what delayed me okay um you're on I think you've done seven of your 25 challenges now do you still when you start a new one do you still have that sense of fear and that sort of sense that you are pushing yourself way outside of your comfort zone and if you do what do you think the value is for people in general of facing their fears and pushing themselves to those limits? It's a really good question and I wish more people asked me something like that um, rather than just what's next because everything I do is about I assess what scares me 
And I want to break that down now. Rather than before in my early 20s, I didn't do things that scared me because I was worried about failing or making a mistake or dying or whatever. Now I know that um, things that scare me, they they always scare you from a distance. And then, but I, I, I want to go and face that because it makes me a better person. And I'm not afraid of failure. I'm not afraid of mistakes because I learn way more from all of my mistakes than I do from successes. So, fuck, give me the chance to fail because it makes me a better person. Um, and I think a lot of people are worried about losing something, whether it's money or time or making a mistake or just not succeeding every single time. Um, that doesn't bother me at all. all I'll, if, if it feels like it's going to be fun, if it feels like I'm going to learn something, and most definitely if it's going to test me, then I'm going to do it. And I do have a sense of trepidation every time I start something, yes, but it's much easier. Now I've taken, up to the first step, it was easier to take the second and on and on and on. And now I can say, Mum, thanks for buying me some swimming goggles for Christmas. I'm going to go and swim a thousand miles, even though I can't swim a hundred meters without dying. That's all it takes. I just need a little seed and I know I can just make it happen. And do you feel like you're always looking for something bigger? I feel like, um, you know, since I quit my job and I've been trying to, you know, face fears and things, but once you've done one, you're like, oh, it's not so bad. So then you're like looking for something bigger and bigger and bigger all the time because you just want this kind of extreme feeling. Well, actually, I, I'm, I guess I'm in this community or this, this adventure scene that I feel like is dominated by people going out and trying to break world records and usurp each other in stories about how they nearly died and then escaped. And there's this constant talk about there's nothing new left to do. And I think that's utter bollocks. I, I, I feel lucky that I, I just get something great out of a new experience. I don't feel like I have to trump my previous experiences because I know that if I, if I swim a thousand miles, it's nothing like skateboarding across Australia. And I know that if I ride an elliptical trainer across Europe, there's no comparison to, to sailing across the Pacific. Every single experience is different. And because it's new to me, not it doesn't matter whether someone else has done it, because it's new to me, I'm the one who, who gets the lessons. Um, I don't learn from someone else going off and doing something. So I just, and I can, luckily, I'm a, I'm a storyteller now, that's how I make my income. So I can translate my experiences in a completely different way from anyone else who's done the same thing, the same route, the same transport. So, no, I, I don't feel under any pressure to ever... Sometimes I've just made a decision to do something that no one's done before, like the swim, like the skateboard, like the stand-up paddleboard, and I get a world record for it. Lovely. But it doesn't really mean anything. It's just because I said yes before someone else said yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, what do you think the principal aim or point of your life is? Oh, good question. Um. God, I like you. <laughs> um... I'm still working that out. I think I'm much closer to understanding what my purpose, what my value is now than I was at the beginning. Because at the beginning, I just wanted to be happy. Whereas now, of course, I still want that. But I, I've been trying to understand the value of what I do, which is mainly hard because, because I, don't, I don't fit in on the whole to this convention that everybody else, that the people who buy my books and the people who come to my lectures are living in. So how can I, not living their life, offer something to them? But I think we've discussed it a little bit already. I, I've learned a lot of lessons and I've broken away from convention that made me unhappy. But, and that, I think, continues to make a lot of other people unhappy. I think, I think the majority of people on this planet still live by expectation. They literally just grow up and they inherit a belief about how they should live, maybe they inherit a, a religion or a political stance or just a, a set of values, but then they're surrounded by lots of information coming at them from different angles, whether it's media or parents or friends or peer pressure or teachers, but they don't have any critical thought. They don't think about what makes them tick. And I think my purpose is just using my stories as an example of feel 
yourself, what are you meant to achieve, you personally? Go and make a living from that. And live according to how you feel, not what you expect. Mm. And I guess that's my value. I've, I, I basically just live what I'm talking about. Um, and that's proof of the pudding. I'm not an extreme athlete at all. Um, I don't even like the term adventurer, really. It's just what... I'm just a doer. I think that's uh, the most the most amazing thing, isn't it? When it's when you can see that it's someone who was completely, well, I'm sure you are completely normal, but <laughs> was living a completely normal life in the sense of it was very similar to lots of other people. So you're not different from them, but you've gone out and you've done this. So for them, they can see, okay, well, he didn't have loads of money, he wasn't special, he didn't, you know, and so it's possible for them too. So yeah, exactly. I think. I think people can relate to what I do um, a lot more because my expeditions are purposefully cheap. Like they, it cost me less to spend three months on the Mississippi than it did to rent a place in London for one month. Mm -hmm. So, and I think money is still a big part in people's heads, even if they don't want it to be. So, everything I do, I think people can relate to, and and it's because I'm just normal. I just, but instead of talking about it, I just do it. Yeah. That's that, that's I think that's probably the biggest purpose of my life um, so far. It may change in a few years. I don't know, but I think I'm also completely open to changing my viewpoints and um, even the path of my life all the time. You know, I'm just going to go with what feels best. Uh, okay, last question. Um, oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Um, you wrote a book a while ago. Um, uh, you were looking for. A girlfriend or love um, and you were doing that by trying to date a hundred women in a hundred days um, I'm about a quarter of the way through um, but I want to know did you find it or not or can you not say or <laughs> I'm not <telling> you. <laughs> you have to read it I you know but it. <laughs> I read um, my readers want to know too <laughs> um well or read the book and then ask me in the next interview. I, okay. I'm single. I'm single at the moment, um, and but but my views are exactly the same. Like I, I think I think my biggest adventure is yet to come um, in terms of love. But I think that that challenge. Um, I think uh, when people fit, first hear about it, it just sounds like, oh, it's just a guy just trying to have sex with a lot of women. It's not like that at all. And I think. Um, if you've got a quarter of the way through, you understand that yeah, now. Yeah, definitely. I, I just wanted to translate, um, I guess, a typical male mind uh, into, into a different way. And, and also break down one of my major fears, which was always, if I see a girl in a bar who I'm attracted to, I'd never had the courage to go up and say hi, because I was afraid of rejection. So I wanted to... That's one of the reasons why I did such an intense challenge, so I could just break down all of those inherent fears. Yeah. And because what if that person at the bar, what if that woman at the bar is the person I'm supposed to spend the rest of my life with? I'm not, I don't want to miss out on that opportunity just because I'm scared of something. Mm -hmm. and I think that just, that runs through everything I do. That's brilliant. I think you're really brave. Um, I'm looking forward to reading the rest of the book and finding out what happened. Um <laughs> Uh, thank you very much and thank you so much for saying yes um, to letting me interview you. It's been brilliant. Um, you're really inspiring. Thank you. Thanks for your time too.